we as church musicians do. It's not just a job. But when I use the word vocation, I'm not talking about occupation. I'm talking about a call. And many times dealing with human beings, you question that. And you're not lesser people because you question that. Human beings irritate other human beings. I'm sure we irritate people who we have to leave. And I know people who we have to leave irritate us. And it's getting beyond that. I said this morning, hopefully in context, you understand where I'm coming from a little bit more. And those of you who are not here, simply to say that our, our, our art must be in service to others. Otherwise, for me, this is now turns into a very narcissistic activity. I will do this little bit of pulpit, of oh, oh, stay on my pulpit. <clears throat> I'm glad for our shows like Bleed and The Voice, specifically because it starts to make especially young men think it might be cool to be in a communal city. Okay? I give it that. And, and you know, I've seen programs that benefit from that. I always think there's every there's good that can always be redeemed out of something. What I'm fearful with is that people start looking at it, and the focus of Glee at the end again is a competition. That somebody has to be number one. And that always in the process, there's some dehumanizing behavior. There's a lot, it feels sometimes more like Daniel the Lion's death, okay? <clears throat> and we do this reality television, and it's all. You know. So I give it credit. I thank it for making communal song and singing experience something that could be popular for, for both boys and girls, especially for boys. But what I want out of that next set of experiences, they don't give me because it turns into me, 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 me. And what we do is to offer back this to our God, and we do this on behalf of the gathering community with our small choirs. And when the big choirs, my friend Dr. John Burson talks about, the big choirs when everyone is singing. And that's our goal to have everyone sing. And when the small choirs offer on behalf of the gathering community, that's even another thing. I entitled this, Do You Hear What I Hear? And I, I guess I want to set forth for you um, a couple of <clears throat> suppositions that I think that when we can develop goals and priorities, and this goes for, not for the singular rehearsal, but as you look at a coming season, a coming year, what are your overall, what are your overall goals? What are your priorities? And from that, you have your action plan. You, you then start to outline your teaching strategies. <coughs> and I think if we don't do that as, as choir directors, we, we are always shooting from What I'm sharing with you are things that have worked for me. I think certain principles that I think many of us can buy into. I mean, you have to look at your situation and you have to say, could it work? And that's the big thing I ask all of you to do today. I would ask in any of the sessions you attend, could it work? Or I tried that, but could it work now? And then you'll have to use good discernment and judgment. For me, um, you're getting my priorities. And then you can judge them 
according to your priority. But the rehearsal goal is to engage the person in body, mind, spirit, and voice and create a transforming experience for the singer and, and a transforming environment. <coughs> then for me, the first thing, the first thing is to nurture beautiful, free, healthy vocal tone. Last night in rehearsal, I gave you my three levels of ugly, right? Ugly, mugly, and bugs. If you weren't there last night, we're all simple human beings. We got a little ugly in us. We got to deal with that. Mugly is mucho ugly. More of our choirs live in mugliness. Okay? You can hear it. You know what it sounds like. And then there's bugly. That's butt ugly. Okay? <laughs> I would hope we could steer our singers away from that. But for me, there's something that doesn't sound beautiful. Most likely it would be all rhythms it would be right. But even if you say all the rhythms were right, everything else, if it's not looking beautiful, that's me. But I think I don't think I know. So that healthy, free, expressive singing. The second thing that becomes more important to me, and you might say, oh, you direct that college choir. I'm not talking about <coughs> the same old choir. Though so, so there's a high priority about what I'm about to say. But it is the attention. Constant attention to secure intonation. The two other choirs that I have in my life, I referred to one of them this morning, this group of boys that I see for part of the year, ages 9 to 14, the Troubadours. The other choir that I have on a weekly basis is one of them. We have eight choirs. We have 3,000 students, and we have over 600 kids in the choirs. Eight, six of the choirs are audition, two are not. Mostly, not people who look like me. There need more of those kids in there, but we created that mission for the students of color, and there's been other kids who've been doing this. And then I have a group called Collegiate Crowd, which is somewhere between 65 to 80 women every semester. <clears throat> and that crew is really the community course, because I have first year students to encourage faculty and staff, women or spouses who are well into their 70s, a couple close to 80. I meet them one, that's my church where I meet them six to seven every Tuesday night. I have five dating habits that don't match pitch. Okay? No kidding. Okay? And they do everything else wrong in their life and they come here and they can't match pitch. That's for especially for type A personalities, that's interesting. But secure intonation is an important thing for me. You think, well, you're doing, you don't and then you want to have to music. Well, my friends, when you have a decently in tune instrument, it's going to quickly show up. <laughs> it really does. And all of a sudden, so that becomes a high priority and goal. Third thing is trying to improve the music literacy. Now, with those two non audition choirs, it's hard with the boys group, we've actually tried to create a musicianship period right before they come to actual rehearsal. But with the women, I don't have time to send them out to sections. Some of this is wrote to note. Some of this is building on the course of the year that when I start to use terminology, they write it down, they do this. Do I have a systematic system yet for the church choir yet? No. So that's somebody else's session, and there are people here who are teaching me. All I know from working with children, I transfer that to adults. But I want them to have some basic knowledge when I talk about clefs, stem, basic keys, system, and to be persistent. Page. System, measure. If your measures are not numbered, yeah, a little dyslexia. I reverse words every once in a while. If your if your measures are not numbered, then you should do that before you start. So you don't have people going, "Where are you starting?" And you'll ask somebody in your church choir that does that. Sometimes they're hard of hearing. Sometimes they're just talking. Okay. But we can. What you're going to see me say in this session, the next session, is how do you get from just accepting that mediocre behavior, and if you go back to those points I said, how do you build the choir to excellence? And you don't have to have a college choir that meets five days a week and that's how they audition. You can get this in your junior choirs, you can get this in your adult church choirs. And you have to be at a certain point where you don't take volunteerism as second rate behavior. What I didn't say to you this morning is that when my, I told you about the powdered milk at home and the real milk at church, but what we, when we volunteer for something, our parents wanted more of it. Not what you just did every day. They expected more. And volunteering.
volunteerism has come to give what have we kind of feel like doing? So if they say, well, we just sing in the church choir, you should kind of accept. No. And it's not just about you. This is not an ego trip about you. But what we are called to do, I think, is to bring people into life what God expects from us. And God doesn't, God didn't give us average. He didn't give an average garden of Eden. And whether you're called to be people of the light, don't smudge it up with dark. My fourth thing is nurturing expressive singing that leads to artistic communication of text and music. In other words, I want them to communicate something more than notes and words. I want people to be touched. I want the music to be sensual. And by that I mean, we use that word and it it's, it's, it's gotten all corrupt in the, 20th, in the 21st century with pornography and eroticism. I want music that touches my senses. I need that music to be sensual. When there's a crescendo, last week we were doing this Chichester song, there was a crescendo. I didn't feel it for the first two days. I started to say, can I feel that crescendo? So I went to, to measure 40. There are two points in the first movement. Jump, bum, bum, jump, bum, bum. You don't feel that. It, it, it takes, but when they did it, they finally did it. It was like, they scared themselves. That's a joyful moment. Can we transfer? Or when there's that moment of tenderness, can they feel it? Can they see it? And my fifth point, my overall goal, <coughs> is creating a safe environment in the rehearsal setting. Establishing community. Not just for a coffee hour, but for <coughs> Now, does that mean that I let them do whatever they want? No. There's some basic grounds. Dear Mother, who I referred to in this talk earlier, uh, my mother was a very strong willed human being. And when I was a senior in high school, I had to conduct the church choir for about six weeks. And she and Hazel Sandy sat in the front row. And Hazel always had to sit in her one year because my mother couldn't have hearing loss in one year. A Hazel, Hazel had, had a voice that could peel paint, okay? <laughs> life lessons in the choir all the time. More so than you ever know. Those are my overall goals. Beautiful singing, secure intonation, trying to prove music literacy, 
nurturing expressive thinking that communicates a beautiful artistic way of the text and music and creating an environment which establishes community. Those are the goals. Do I do them all by myself? No. I need those folks to take ownership. And part of what I'm suggesting in this model of body, mind, spirit, and voice is also that you releasing responsibility, which is scary too. But where those people have to be handled, they are responsible. Do you hear any sounds coming out of my hands? In this midst of this audience, I will tell you, we are powerless. We think we have lots of power. We are delusional, you think that. <laughs> it's an understanding of trust of people wanting to come and that they're willing to trust you to lead and that you have the ability to galvanize. So if those are my goals, what are my priorities? What am I going to set high in my teaching? <coughs> First thing for me <coughs> is that I want to establish the ingredients needed to develop healthy, free, beautiful, expressive singing. In your handout, I hope you all have that. If you don't, raise your hand up. I see more passes from out. Okay, so she's going to hand out some. You have the hand out in the second, in the back of the page of the front. You turn to that. <coughs> this is actually a grid that Lynn Gaff and I put together many years ago when we were doing some sessions, and I continue to use it because it's a very useful guide. It's something I look at in teaching of the voice. It's a thing I, I look at anytime I take a rehearsal with a choir, and it becomes a grid for me to consider what do I want to accomplish. Those foundational techniques are something that I want to do in every rehearsal. <coughs> and if you subscribe to the idea that you are building in a high priority for you becomes that you don't want them to sing ugly, then you're going to subscribe to this. <coughs> Every rehearsal for me, whether I have, as I do with the two and nine audition choir teams, right, only now, it can't go over. People have to come to the room. I have a trombone choir that to come in with when the women are done. I have another group of people ready to come in when the boys are done. So I can't pull them over. Plus, I'm tired of going home. Because those rehearsals happen at night, and I'm hungry, and I haven't eaten since noon. Okay? For me, um, every rehearsal has to have some level of vocal preparation and body preparation. You may call it warm up. I'm going to give you the German term Stimmelbuch. children of PhDs and they think they're special. <laughs> I'd rather the farm kids who come in and their parents don't understand that they can work for everything. And that they're good hard working kids. But they're not as special as they are. <laughs> and the other thing is maturity. <clears throat> Adults are far from mature human beings. Just raise your hands and she'll get them to you next. Adults are far from <clears throat> mature human beings. Spend time with 
the church and the academy, and you'll find out very quickly. So it's the idea that we're all going to try to be mature human beings. The rehearsal starts at 8, be there at 8. Don't slide in. And every week, that body has to get prepared. I'm here in a situation where you might see singers every day if you're high school teacher. Those kids have been using their voices and their bodies in different ways than what you need for that rehearsal. And if you don't take that eight to ten minutes to prepare them, you are just eating yourself. If they've been like this and just come off the road like this as we do up in North, they need to relax on those muscles because they got white muscles. You know, if all day long they've been saying, no, 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 mama says no, 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 no. You expect that person to sing in a complete sentence? <laughs> you better do something to get the mind and the voice going that way. Right? If they've been over computer all day long, and their body has no sense, or they've been sitting in a train for half, you know, an hour and a half to get home, shut down there and get here real close. They need to prepare the body. And so this whole idea of posture body mind, the idea of breath management, go through this pretty quickly. But understanding that breathing for singing is different than what the people do every day. Right? Stand up. Let's make a point. I don't want you to fall asleep this afternoon. You notice last night when you did the first thing we did was to get the body to the and push you all but I need, and I'm going to find some people who can't do this. Maybe bodies are not working where they did once in their lives. But you want to get the bodies as reasonably as possible. We're doing a lot of things. Part of what I was trying to see last night were people able to multitask. Were they able to listen to what I was saying to them and still move? And sometimes people can, and some people you seem like just a deer in the headlights. <laughs> And Andre Thomas is a wonderful routine he often does with some of his all state wives before he says anything. He doesn't talk at me. But he was just saying, do as I do. So let's try to do as I do. Do as I do. Now, what did I accomplish with that? Raise your hands. What did I accomplish with that? First of all, I got you to focus. What else did I establish with that? Communication, nonverbal communication, because that's what you want the rehearsal out of it. What else did I get? Got to see if you have rhythm. And could you figure out? Because one was an offbeat. Now, without me telling you, think of it. But could you follow that? That would have told me a lot of things. Then I might have to restructure my rehearsal. What else did I do? Facial expression, attitude. Because if I just had the camera on you at the end, you were like this. Most of y'all. <laughs> <laughs> there are still a few evil people. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and then that tells me, okay, they're the ones that are going to test me. <laughs> what else I do from a standpoint of psychology? What else? Community. Explain what you mean by that. Working as a group. Okay, so you're working as a group. What else about the psychology? What else did I just establish in that exercise? It's okay to step outside your comfort zone. Ah, big thing. You know, a lot of people, we don't move. We don't move in church. Yeah. We don't move in the rehearsal. And all of a sudden, you're doing that. What other things? You're the leader. Uh. <laughs> I'm the leader. We set the balance. But I did it inviting you without being, you will do this. <laughs> yeah. But I control the parameters. But you joyfully joined in. And that's what I'm talking about. All of a sudden, we can have fun together. But you're the one that's going to set Now, those ones who are doing like this, those are a couple. 
I'm not going to let him take my attention. 25 years ago, they would have drawn my attention the whole time. But at some point, I'm going to figure out who they are. I'm not going to embarrass him in front of the whole choir. I might put him on notice. And then later, I'll find Because <coughs> sometimes they don't even know what they're doing. They've got so this is how. <laughs> or they don't realize they're doing it. It's been amazing. touch the sound source, we don't have a way of connecting them. Nor this obviously is not controlling the pipes, but here she will press a pedal or a key that responds. String player, presses down, yeah. Wind player, brass player. You can't touch your vocal cords. You cannot touch your diacostal muscles. So we have to use kinesthetic outward body motion to help us. And sometimes there are also and the more that we can get into using that, especially with our less developed centers, the quicker progress you can make. If your people are not studying privately, you have to do this. You are a voice teacher, whether you like it or not. When you're up here leading the group, you're teaching the voice. You're the primary voice teacher. This last one is tact. If I can make one generalistic statement, but I think it's you have to understand, and those of you who've been in the field a while, I think you'll even understand it better. I love hearing um, when I run to the teacher and says, you know, 20 years ago, those kids could do this, and they can't stand doing it. 
Some of that's true. We have more teachers sometimes teaching at an earlier level and they stick a track in the tape and they say, say. We have less skills being taught, whether it's in the schools or in the churches. But can they do it? Yes. But you encounter more people at an older age with less developed skills. Like your friend at Florida State, Judy Bauer, was talking, was talking about the developmental center. And I think the days of us expecting that people just come into our choir and they can read and sound beautiful, they're we have to do more of the stage work than we've got other people to do. Okay. I know it's a common term to think if you're at high school level that the junior highs are theater, and if you're the college level, the senior highs are theater, if you're graduate school, the undergraduate school is theater. Stop thinking about it like that. Because you create kind of this species sort of thing where I'm going to eat them up. <laughs> but if you don't value the work that's being done before, then we're only going to incur more problems as we go on. And that you have to understand that you have to do these things now. The entries are to your first. And you feel just very fortunate in this day and age. My second generalization is that everything we ask them to do in a choral rehearsal from a physical focal standpoint is abnormal to how they use their voice in their bodies. It is abnormal. People do not go around breathing like this. How are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. Did you hear that tune on the radio? You get a bunch of high school kids in your choir and you say, they don't want to open their mouth. They will never open their mouth. This is an open mouth for about 12 to 18 year old. So, my uh mouth. -huh. That's abnormal. I'm not being funny with it, I'm being very serious. So I go on and work with a bunch of folks, whether it's my own or when I go out and get skinned up and work with that age group, they think I'm wax. <coughs> and that means I'm being successful. Because I'm an out whack then at that point. But it's the same, you can't do, you know.
Lord calls him how he speaks. And you know in this state, that draw, and then you try to put it to pitch music. Can we identify the diphthong? This is what I mean. I said, that's a diphthong. Show me the first ball. Show me the second ball. And somewhere between the first and second ball, there are two other balls. They had never heard before in this <laughs>
those two things have to deal most of all with the idea that your voice does adjust. But can you get out of the idea that you have a break? The minute you start thinking you have a break in the voice, you will have a break. But will you go back to the Italian masters and they talk about passaggio, passaggio, the passage. <coughs> Just going on the breath. 
yet many for it to be this shrill scream that's turned into it. It was just a very gentle way. And we heard it last week. We were going up the choir last week in, in, in Prague. And Andre and I was like, yes, that's what it's supposed to be. We went back to study the films and we worked with many of the students. Very gentle to engage the breath. Can you use a gentle song? to know that much. Too much to get you to trouble. But enough to know that the breath and these foundational things are important. The whole idea of register development is start with the lighter and bring, start the middle of the voice to go down and then ascend. <coughs> Final thing for me is resonation. And I don't mean, I'm talking about resonance and I'm not talking about the mic. How do you fill this room and the language you developing good breath energy and that you're, 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 you're watching what you ask yourself to do. Those are foundational techniques. And I spent time on that because I think a lot of times we skip. <coughs> My second priority, that's a lot for that first priority, which was establishing and incorporating the ingredients needed to develop healthy, free, beautiful things. If you were to do that consistently over here, you'd hear a change in your wires. If you take the short you'll get lost. You'll derail. You might get there, but slow and steady. Okay. Two, you have to have a concept of good singing sound in your head. You have to have a concept in your ear and in your mind and your imagination. It may come from listening to a, a number of types of recordings or doing the type of singing you are doing if you study voice. But what's going to happen? You have to have a concept in your head. I do not try to make those singers that I had last year, the last week, sound like singers that I have who are very primarily between 18 and 22. But what I have in my head is I want the sound to be clear, I want it to be free and relieved, and I want to find the center of the pitch. I never ask the choir to blend, I never ask the choir to sing straight tone. When I was done with my time here in Baylor, that's what I had told the voice back to me. We expect you to use that now. We expect you to tell them this one. I never did. Blend is an after effect. Blend, I remember this is on some of you informed me. And you may say that's semantic, but blending is like the color of the ceiling. It's white. I like to think of a coral mosaic. And one of the things I'm going to do in the next session is I'm going to go through partially how I see the choir. Last week, we took the time the first day for me to re see 226 singers. Okay. And for people who said, oh, we've never seen that done, or they were scared because they're going to make this about themselves, or whatever, <coughs> the difference in the sound was like that. And even if I had done it with my 12 West Church Bar, my other church bar, it had several impacts. First of all, I believe people who weren't fighting as much with each other. I also gave a psychological reason that you're important. Your voice, maybe you don't have a big solo voice, but maybe you're needed for another reason in the sun song. Because I can't have two pieces by each other. You're my blue. Or you give me this color, you give me this quality. And I want to talk about that, but that will come in my second, my second session. My third thing is your selection of things. And I'm not 
this one's done on audition for. You can do that later tomorrow morning. You all want to ask about how to audition. I'll talk to you about that. What I'm saying to you is that people come to your choir, audition, non audition. I think they have to share something. This is not always the case. They have to have, <coughs> to have a desire in their hearts to share the gift of singing in a group setting, in community. Okay? If you have somebody who decides, I have to be the star, my voice has to be the most important, you will have issues. If they cannot have a servant spirit, you have issues. So even those days in the church choir, I would talk, we would not audition, but I would talk to people. I would sometimes listen to the range, I just wanted to make sure they would tell me, oh, I'm a problem, and I'd go, maybe not like you thought you were. Yeah. Or they would tell me I'm a tenor. Another one of my important um, priorities as I go through this you know, is I'm working to get an even sound throughout the range. So I come back inside and decide, I don't want to know that that's your passage point. So we're working so that we don't have excessive flutters, tremolos, and we can get through that. I'm also trying to increase the tonal memory, the ear volume of our space. James Jordan, who teaches at Westminster Choir College and is most likely with more of a music education, by the time you do it, but he does. They have a wonderful term. I love it. It's called aware hearing. I translate it listen louder than you sing. <coughs> listen louder than you sing. Our rehearsal last week, the frog started off with everybody trying to show me an object just how beautiful their voices were. So I went through the first rehearsal and I said, Now that you've had your deeds of time, can we go back and Skill and ability to listen is the most important factor in any ensemble, instrumental or vocal. That is the most important thing. Now, I'm going to give you all a break. Some of you may want to go to another session if you want to come back and the rest of it. But let me tell you what I want to do in the next session. <coughs> I'm taking time to give you an idea of the strategies. I'm going to do a couple of things. I want to take you through and I want to do some voice placement. I'm going to ask some of you to be ready to come up here. I also want to take you through a piece, a couple of pieces that we have, we'll hand those out at the break. Um, and I want, to, want you to go through and see how, what am I talking about when I say expressive sound? We started to touch on some of those. And I want to continue to look at this in a way of being strong leaders, but creating an environment in which you turn responsibly over to them. We still get an attitude too much in our rehearsal we have to do everything. We have to be control the rhythm. We have to control this. And the more that we make them dependent on us, the less they'll do. Human beings, by nature, are naturally lazy. Okay? And 
unless we encourage the opposite. You don't have to have an audition choir to get that. But they have that and you're not going to do it for them. And it's called patient persistence. It's not just adolescents who can be passive aggressive in behavior. Too many adult choirs are like that. And they'll press you. And they'll sing as other. I saw it last week. The, the bassoon player and the Mozart reference Brian Ray decided that he didn't like something Brian Ray did. And by God, every time he came, the first entrance to the system was a major entrance to the theme. He flopped. Finally, in the country, he didn't do it. He might have thought he was, he was frustrating. Either. He was. But he just showed how immature you could be. The professional, right? And later I found one of my student, former students who speaks chess, that he and the concert master were going back and forth in chess. Finally, the concert master was saying, you need to grow up. He's the conductor. Do what he's asking. 